Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for being here today. I'd like to begin by thanking Superintendent of Public Instruction, Kathy Hoffman, Dr. Kara Christ, Major General Mick McGuire, and Anne Marie Almadin with the Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association, along with other leaders in the healthcare industry, for joining us this afternoon. Over the last couple of months, a lot has changed in our world, and we've certainly seen that firsthand in Arizona. On Sunday, January 26th, Dr. Christ briefed us on the first confirmed case of novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, in Arizona. On January 27th, we activated the Health Emergency Operations Center to track the spread and coordinate our state's response. Nationwide, we've seen the spread surge. No state has been exempted from this outbreak. On March 2nd, thanks to the leadership of Dr. Christ and our state health professionals, the Arizona State Lab became one of the first labs in the nation to be certified by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to test for COVID-19. By Wednesday, March 11th, Arizona had nine confirmed cases of COVID-19. On the same day, taking every precaution necessary, I declared a public health emergency and issued an executive order suspending visitation to nursing facilities to protect those at highest risk of the disease, the elderly, those we love the most, our parents and our grandparents. On March 15th, amid staffing shortages at our schools, I was grateful to have the partnership of Superintendent Kathy Hoffman in announcing a statewide school closure in Arizona. On March 19th, as hospitals across the country struggled with critical resources, including masks, gowns, and gloves, we halted elective surgeries to free up medical resources and maintain the capacity for those providing essential services. As, as stores struggled to keep their shelves full during unprecedented demand, we activated the Arizona National Guard to assist grocery stores and food banks with restocking shelves. And the same day, in accordance with public health recommendations and the CDC, I issued an executive order requiring restaurants in Arizona counties with confirmed COVID-19 cases to provide dine-out options only and closing bars, movie theaters, and gyms. That was not an easy decision. As a former small business owner, I know the strain that it's placed on our economy, our employees, and our employers. But it was the right thing to do, and it was the right time to do it. Across the state, Arizonans are doing their part. It's clear from the empty streets and traffic-free highways that Arizonans are heeding the advice of public health officials. Businesses have closed or implemented physical distancing measures. People are staying home, staying safe, and staying healthy. Churches and congregations aren't meeting Casinos aren't operating. Spring training is canceled. Opening day has been delayed. Sporting events aren't occurring. And the opportunity to congregate in large numbers has significantly, if not entirely, diminished. And today there's no such thing as rush hour in Tucson or Phoenix. Arizonans are staying home because it's the right thing to do. My top priority has been protecting public health, and it's been the top priority of my team and of our entire state government. With the steady leadership of Dr. Kara Christ and General Mick McGuire, we've been working nonstop. Just this past weekend, in response to a surge of cases on the Navajo Nation, they worked together to assess the health care need and deploy two Black Hawk helicopters filled with eight medically trained military personnel and 19 guardsmen to set up field hospitals, adding 50 hospital beds. It's been an all-hands-on-deck approach, and my entire administration has been part of it. Chief Operating Officer Daniel Ruiz is coordinating our agencies. Through my office, 
working with leaders like Sandra Watson of the Arizona Commerce Authority, who's working with small businesses to provide small business economic relief resources. Agency directors like DES Director Tom Betlack, who stepped out of retirement, and I want to say thank you again to Tom Betlack, stepped out of retirement to ensure that Arizona's social safety net is stretched and strengthened. And DCS Director Michael Faust, who's been steadfast in his efforts to mitigate the impacts of school closures on Arizona's mis most vulnerable children. Just today, this team took additional actions. These are our latest, and they will not be our last. Look for more throughout the week. We announced a cooperative agreement with banks to protect small businesses and families from eviction and foreclosure. Under the agreement, banks are suspending evictions and foreclosures for at least 60 days, with the potential to extend that period for the duration of the state's emergency declaration. I want to thank our banks and bankers for stepping up and our entire business community for being good corporate citizens through this crisis. Also today, we announced the $6.7 million in funding to support Arizona food banks and nutrition programs and programs that serve the homeless. And also, we had an announcement on our schools. In times of crisis, the leaders really stand out. And I've been grateful to Superintendent Kathy Hoffman for her leadership and partnership in ensuring Arizona takes a thoughtful approach to implementing school closures, protecting students and teachers. Earlier today, Superintendent Hoffman and I announced an extension of Arizona school closures through the end of the school year, giving parents the time to plan and to plan ahead. For more on the announcement, I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Hoffman. Kathy? Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Ducey, for your continued partnership during these difficult times. Today, we made the difficult decision to extend school closures through the end of the 2019-20 school year. This applies to all public, district, and charter schools. This decision was made in the best interest of the health of our students, teachers, and their families to do our part in flattening the curve of the spread of COVID-19. This was not an easy decision, nor one we have taken lightly. I am very aware that for many students, school is the only place that they feel safe and taken care of. But this step is critical in helping slow the spread of the virus and providing stability to our school communities and families. Over the past several weeks, we have been preparing for this possibility, including convening education stakeholders and legislators to work on policies in the event that schools would not resume this year. Because of that work, we were able to guarantee full pay for educators and school staff through the end of the school closures, providing financial stability and certainty to our school communities. That legislation passed both chambers unanimously and was signed by the governor last week. I know families with seniors expecting to graduate this May are worried about how this will affect graduation. At tomorrow's State Board of Education meeting, we will be discussing graduation requirements, A through F grades, and remote learning documentation. We'll have more to share on that tomorrow. I want to be clear that while school facilities are closed through the end of the school year, learning and instruction is still happening and will continue. These past few weeks, I've been inspired by the way our educators and students have risen to meet the challenges imposed by COVID-19. I've heard from so many superintendents, principals, and educators across our state that while students are not currently in their school buildings, every effort is being made to provide them with educational opportunities. I encourage you to check out the closed, not closed hashtag on social media to see more examples of our school communities rising to meet this moment and serve their students and families. But I also like to share some of these with you today. In the Awa Freya School District, 
teachers are conducting le lessons via Google Classrooms, holding virtual office hours, meeting with their professional learning communities over video calls, and developing their lesson online lesson plans with the help of curriculum specialists and administrators. At the academies of math and science, teachers and students are keeping spirits and expectations high. They've been hosting virtual spirit weeks with themed days, including Motivational Monday, and offering Zoom lunches with school leaders and teachers so that students can continue to eat with their favorite adults from campus. In all 15 counties, more than 545 schools are continuing to meet the nutritional needs of our students by delivering free breakfast and lunch to any child under the age of 18. In Sholo, school staff have even handed out meals in the snow. Many schools that did not previously offer free and reduced lunch or summer meals quickly applied to begin offering meals to students and our agency has worked hard to make sure that almost any school that wants to provide nutritional assistance during this crisis is able to do so. It's not just our educators who are leading in this moment. Our students have also stepped up in incredible ways. At Blue Ridge Unified School District in Pine Top Lakeside, lead STEM instructor Mr. Kevin Woolridge and a few of his students are using their labs 3D printing capabilities to produce 325 protective masks and a prototype of a ventilator. This small team is practicing social distancing by working in isolation, but they are also committed to finding real world solutions to address the mask and ventilator shortages nationwide required to fight COVID-19. Stories like this give me endless hope and remind me that with the talents and commitments of every student, teacher, and community member, we will get through this together. It's critical for me to share, however, that there are major gaps in access to technology, technolo the technology that students and family need in order to continue the, the learning process online. Many families simply do not have the resources causing a high demand for devices, including laptops and hotspots. This crisis will worsen many of the inequities that have long existed across our system and that for years have widened the achievement gap between, between under-resourced communities and their more advantaged counterparts. We must address these inequities both in the face of a global pandemic and after this crisis has passed. I am also very concerned by the extra burden school closures place on our students with special needs and their families. The services provided at our public schools are critical to their wellness and success. The Arizona Department of Education is working overtime to provide clear guidance to schools on how to ensure continuity of services and general education opportunities for our students with special needs. In the meantime, we've encouraged schools to be as flexible and creative as possible to meet all of our students' needs, sending take-home packets, calling students and families, and using bus routes to deliver meals and homework. Our Department of Education is diligently working to comprehensively address the obstacles associated with distance and digital learning. We are working with other state agencies to increase access to Wi-Fi and hotspots, as well as broadband in our rural communities. We have sent guidance to districts and schools on how to leverage existing federal funds to purchase technology for students. And our department's K-12 standards team has already begun to hold weekly meetings with district content specialists to understand our teachers' needs and challenges during this new learning environment. As this situation continues, the Department of Education will continue to work with schools across the state to address and fill these gaps to the best of our ability. I'm thankful for partners like Arizona PBS and Arizona Public Media for stepping up and providing blocks of educational programming by grade on their networks. 
You can find details on our website about these resources and many others, which is azed.gov. I want to again remind all Arizonans that our children and students are looking to adults for comfort and reassurance in these scary and uncertain times. It is our role, above all else, to set an example of kindness, compassion, patience, and goodwill as we continue to navigate this situation together. Finally, to all of Arizona's students, I could not be prouder of each and every one of you. Although this school year doesn't look the way we thought it would, I know that we are going to come out of this even stronger and more resilient than ever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Throughout this process, I've made it clear. In Arizona, we are going to take a calm and steady approach, making data-driven decisions and act with urgency to protect public health and build capacity in our health care system. Today, I'm announcing that the time for further action is now. Earlier this morning, Dr. Kara Christ, the same leader who saw Arizona through H1N1, Ebola, and the 2016 measles outbreak, made the recommendation that we enhance our mitigation strategies. Her recommendation, based on the latest Arizona-specific data, is to implement enhanced physical distancing measures. Moments ago, I signed an executive order directing Arizonans to stay home, stay healthy, and stay connected. Across the country, we've seen stay-at-home orders and shelter-in-place orders. And once the semantics are set aside, the implementation and the goal are one and the same. Enhanced physical distancing measures to slow the spread of COVID-19. Our order takes a uniquely Arizona approach. It's a whole holistic approach that prioritizes all of public health. Placing a focus on staying home to slow the spread. Staying healthy and active and staying connected to provide the much needed support we can provide one another in these unprecedented times. Effective tomorrow at close of business, Arizonans are directed to limit their time away from home, except to conduct or participate in essential activities or essential services. We do not want people to feel trapped or isolated in their homes. The weather is beautiful right now. Find a way to get out and enjoy it with physical distancing. One important point that I want to stress, and I ask the media to help amplify this, grocery stores and pharmacies are not closing. Grocery stores and pharmacies are not closing. They will remain open, and everyone should continue to buy one week's worth of groceries for one week's worth of needs. That way, there will be plenty of stock available for everyone in our state. Our supply chain is strong. And restaurants across the state can continue to offer takeout and delivery services. Please patronize your local restaurants and be as generous as you can with your tips to our service workers. While this physical distancing order will not eliminate the spread of the virus, it can continue to help slow the spread. Already there is evidence that the steps we've taken to date are making a difference. Our goal here is to protect the lives of those we love most and to ensure the healthcare system has the capacity to provide them with the care and comfort they deserve. For more on the findings and recommendations that led to this order and how Arizona is working to increase capacity in our healthcare system, I want to turn it over to Dr. Kara Christ, Director of the Department of Health Services, along with Major General Mick McGuire of the Arizona National Guard and Anne Marie Almadine of the Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association. Dr. Christ. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. 
As Governor Ducey mentioned in his remarks, the tr world truly has changed over the last few months. Across the country, we've seen the rapid spread of COVID-19, a highly contagious, serious, and in some cases, fatal disease, and no state in the nation has been spared. As of today, Arizona now has 1,157 cases in all 15 counties across Arizona. We've seen the tragic loss of 20 Arizona lives. With widespread transmission of COVID-19 in our state and increased testing, we know these numbers will only continue to increase. To date, we've taken aggressive action to follow CDC guidance to combat the spread with school closures and the governor's executive order to prohibit dine-in services at restaurants and the closure of all bars, movie theaters, and gyms. Across the state, public health officials have been grateful for the governor's thoughtful, data-driven approach in Arizona's response to COVID-19. In making our decisions, we continuously monitor several data points, including the number of cases, the spread of the virus through our communities, and the impact on our hospitals. Our epidemiologists track these figures as a way to make informed recommendations on all of our mitigation strategies, and we take all aspects of public health into consideration, including the mental health and well-being of our citizens. Arizona, much like the rest of the nation, continues to see an increase in cases and deaths. It has now impacted all of Arizona with confirmed cases in every county. As we've built capacity in testing, we've seen an increase in the percent of community lab tests that are positive. And our hospitals have seen an increase in patient visits for COVID-like illnesses. Public health has been working with our healthcare and county partners to mitigate the spread of a few outbreaks among high-risk groups. COVID-19 is extremely contagious and it is so important to take steps to protect those at highest risk for complications and deaths. We've worked very closely with our commercial lab partners to build capacity in our testing and we're seeing positive results from these efforts. It has been ramping up. To date, 16,759 tests have been administered. That's an increase of about 6,700 tests since Friday. Our healthcare system continues to maintain strong capacity and we've taken steps to preserve critical PPE supplies and add beds necessary to accommodate our worst scenario projections. In addition to Governor Ducey's order suspending elective surgeries to preserve PPE to date, we've received nearly 75% of Arizona's strategic national stockpile supplies. We've gotten over 181,000 N95 masks, 532,000 surgical face masks, 54,048 face shields, almost 60,000 surgical gowns, and over 430,000 gloves. In terms of ventilators, we assessed our inventory of roughly 1,000 ventilators across the state, and we're currently directing $10 million from the Public Health Emergency Fund to provide funding to hospitals for the purchase of additional ventilators. We continue to monitor our request and work with our Health and Human Services partners for the 5,000 additional ventilators we requested. And we continue to survey anesthesiology devices used in outpatient procedures that might be available to convert to ventilators that could treat those with COVID-19. Currently, we have 16,900 hospital beds in Arizona and 1,530 ICU licensed beds. Last Thursday, Governor Ducey issued an executive order requiring hospitals to increase their bed capacity and take steps to optimize staffing levels and maximize critical resources. Over the weekend, we engaged the Army Corps of Engineers to assess locations across the state for alternate care sites and additional high acuity care. Beginning today, the Army Corps will work with the Arizona National Guard to begin reactivation of St. Luke's Hospital, which will add about 340 high acuity ICU beds. And we'll continue to assess sites in Maricopa County and in our state's northern and southern regions. The mental health and well being is always top of mind for public health professionals. And with federal and state legislation to provide economic relief for Arizonans during these challenging times, as well as a number of initiatives implemented by the governor through the executive order, we're hopeful this will help alleviate anxiety and fear among the citizens of our state. Based on our, 
based on our epidemiological analysis and in alignment with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, I believe now is the appropriate time to recommend elevating our guidance. I don't make this recommendation lightly. As I've said before, I have significant concerns about the public health impacts that a prolonged physical distancing strategy could have on the mental health of Arizonans, the financial ramifications to individuals and businesses, and the fear and anxiety caused by COVID-19 can also have a negative impact on our community's mental health. During these unprecedented times, now more than ever, it's important that we emphasize the support we can provide to our fellow citizens and make it clear. Physical distancing should not deter us from social connectedness. I'm grateful to the governor for issuing the stay home, stay healthy, stay connected order, and for his commitment to protecting all aspects of public health. I urge every Arizonan to heed the advice of our public health professionals. Doing so will preserve capacity in our healthcare system and protect the lives of Arizonans at high risk for complications due to this disease. You can find additional information on the governor's stay home, stay healthy, stay connected order, enhanced information about confirmed cases and testing, and additional preventive measures that you and your family can take to reduce the spread of COVID-19 at azhealth.gov. With that, I'll hand it over to Major General McGuire, who through the Arizona Department of Emergency Management and the National Guard has been an invaluable partner in protecting public health. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to give you a quick update and first say thank you so much to Governor Ducey, the Commander in Chief of the Arizona National Guard, and his full faith and confidence in our leadership team doing both emergency management and military affairs in our agency. Uh, as he mentioned earlier, uh, I want to provide a little context for all of you about how the state responds when I talk about the idea that local incidents are executed and when resources are overwhelmed, they call us for state management. If we're not able to do that, we uh, reach out to the federal government for greater levels of support or enduring commitments. Uh, Saturday night at around uh, 2050 or 850 in the evening, I got a call from um, both FEMA, our Health Emergency and State Emergency Operations Center about an emergent situation in Tuba City at an Indian Health Services facility there uh, that had more patients that needed acute care than staff available. We quickly generated uh, Team Arizona to coordinate with the uh, Flagstaff Regional Medical Center CEO to send a, uh, a liaison officer out there to assess the situation on the ground. While we simultaneously were able to put together an eight-person medical go team from the Arizona Army National Guard. We brought them in and launched them at eight o'clock the next morning with two Blackhawks, and we loaded on that black, those Blackhawks additional PPE for the staff at the facility in Tuba City. That eight-person crew was able to assist not only with the care of patients, but provide uh, assistance quickly to remedy and stabilize the situation. I'm happy to say that additionally, our federal partners resourced a 14-person national disaster medical support team that Dr. Christ authorized and that team arrived this morning and will be able to be assisting in Tuba City with the increased capacity as we've developed a plan to help move out the high acuity patients to higher levels of care in the region. When uh, Governor Ducey mentioned the issue with uh, field maintenance uh, or field uh, medical facilities that we requested, Arizona was able to resource the last of the 50 uh, federal medical systems a 50 bed unit and we set it up at Chinle. Completion of that setup was done about an hour ago. Many of you heard me talk when we first talked about task force logistics and the delivery of the food supply that there may be an additional requirement for other task forces, engineering, logistics, aviation, and in this particular case all of those things were relevant. When we received the equipment and Dr. Chris' team was able to say that it was there to be trucked to the, to the facility in Chin Lee, the federal government and FEMA has a contract, but all eight teams that are contracted to do that were deployed to other locations. So we immediately pivoted 26 of our soldiers from Task Force Logistics, sent them to Chin Lee with trucks and equipment, and that facility is up, 
but not yet running as we work through the staffing problem to staff that 50 bed facility for low acuity patients servicing all of the Navajo Nation, not just in Arizona, but in New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado as well. Finally, to the discussion about the uh, St. Luke's and the high acuity. In the name of expectation management, Sunday we signed an agreement after the Corps of Engineers did a site survey to reactivate eight of the nine floors at St. Luke's. We'll develop statements of work in the next 72 hours with an estimated time of completion to reactivate the facility of 21 days. We'll do that through contracted entities and our great uh, Arizona construction companies and those that can immediately meet those needs. And we are now pivoting, as Dr. Christ mentioned, to look at low acuity sites in northern, central, and southern Arizona, and how we would staff and design those systems, again, with contract or guardsmen to gap coverage until we can get those things on contract. So I'm so proud of this team. Team Arizona led by Governor Ducey, and I'm absolutely confident we'll be able to continue to manage these things. I want you all to stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, General McGuire. A note from Arizona hospitals. Arizona hospitals across the state are preparing for this emergency. In accordance with the governor's executive order, we've, uh, we are increasing our capacity by 50% uh, within a month. And hospitals have been there to care for our communities and our patients as you need it. And we will be here during COVID-19. And as you all know, uh, hospitals prepare for emergencies on a routine basis. But there is nothing routine about COVID-19. And hospitals and the healthcare providers cannot do this alone. We require all Arizona citizens to take heed to stay home, to stay healthy, to stay connected, because the healthcare community and the providers who provide that care to you and your family are relying on that. So stay home and take care and be safe. Thank you, Anne Marie. I really appreciate that. I think we say stay home, stay healthy, and stay connected. Uh, General McGuire, thank you very much. Dr. Christ as, as well, and all, all our health care leaders that are joining us today. Uh, we'll take some questions. Let's start with Howie. Governor, let me start off with the, your uh, directive, sort of stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Uh, what's the, the hammer on this? What's the penalty if somebody decides, I want to go out, I want to hang around, I want to go to a the specifics the specifics are are in the executive order uh, I'll refer you to that I mean the idea is we want people to to stay home of course to stay healthy and and like I said that means getting outside you can be active you just need to socially distance from one another if you're sick you should stay home and the stay connected part of it is that uh, this is going to be a, t a tough month or, or two. Uh, April can be a very difficult month on the on mentally fragile. Uh, so let's use the technologies that we have. Uh, let's FaceTime people. Uh, I've got a 96-year-old grandmother that lives in this state. Uh, my mom would be mad at me if I called out her age, but let, let me just say that my 96-year-old grandmother had my mom when she was very young. Uh, my my father-in-law is 93 years old. Uh, w we've been doing a lot of phone calls, a, a lot of FaceTiming, uh, and, and we want people to, to stay connected. And we think that's a good way for the entire uh, health care of not only combated COVID-19, but allowing people to not go stir crazy and to be active and if they want to get on their bike or, or go for a walk or, or a run, and then t taking care of those that, that need help, staying in touch. There are enforcement mechanisms in the order, and, uh, and, and, and the business, the, the definitions are detailed. Yeah, so can you specifically talk about how this will impact Arizona in particular? What do you see, what do you hope to see change compared to the business? 
special services and needs, in particular golf courses, even salons? So the, the objective here is to continue to mitigate and to slow the spread. And like I said, this decision was made with Arizona-specific data to where our state is. Uh, all of us have been very busy. Uh, we've been working very hard. Uh, this was the first weekend I was able to actually be home for a little bit, and I watched some of the national news. And now I better understand uh, the, the fear and anxiety that is gripping the, the nation and, and, of course, the state. Um, we have had vigilance and concern since day one on this, and we're going to continue to have that. Arizona is in a different position than other places that have been hit first and hit harder. We are not only given the time to plan and prepare, we are in a pretty good position right now. Now, we're going to continue to get all hands on deck, increase hospital capacity, uh, build health care capacity, and plan for a potential worst-case scenario. So the idea is this will have fewer people outside. Uh, already, things have shut down to a large degree. They're going to shut down even further. But the idea of the focus is I, I wanted to, to make sure that the order is out there, that it's clear that there are enforcement mechanisms, but uh, some of the language uh, that, that you hear on the, the national shows, and I want to thank the people in the room, that's not what I've heard from, from our media, and we've really, I think, done a good job in getting the facts out there and, and reducing the fear because the facts are enough to, to concern people. But when you, you use words like shelter in place, well, I mean, th that's what happens during a, a nuclear attack. Uh, that's what happens uh, when there's an active shooter. Uh, we want people to stay at home. It'll have the same type of effect. Uh, but we also realize that people are going to need an outlet, and there's a way to do it in a safe way. And the order has the, the mechanisms. JJ, can you give us some examples of activities that would be okay today under the current guidance? I'm going to refer you to the, I'm going to refer you to the order. So I'm surrounded by subject matter experts, and I'm listening to them. And I'll bring the subject matter expert to the podium so she can explain her, her rationale in the guidance she gave me today. When we looked at the data, we were looking at several different um, aspects. And one of the things we were trying to assess was the, the health of our health care system. So in addition to the numbers and the number of counties, we did hit all 15 counties. We are widespread in Arizona. We monitor through um, different types of surveillance the impact of um, visits for COVID-like illness or influenza-like illness to our emergency rooms and our um, uh, our inpatient facilities. And so what we saw was an increase, a sustained increase in those visits um, over the past couple of weeks. And then we also, um, we also look at what type of, um, how many positive out of our commercial labs. So what's the percent of positives that individuals are, who are symptomatic and are getting tested are? Because that gives us a baseline and we had just in this last week seen an increase in that as well. Um, I believe we went from a 2% to a 6% and almost a 7% of the, all, all of the visits being for COVID-like illness. Um, that exceeded the, the threshold that we had, that my epidemiologists had set, and I believe we're at about a 6% um, positivity rate in our commercial labs. Okay, hi. Uh, Governor and Dr. Chris, a lot of people in the community want to donate PPE. Is the state going to have a centralized way of donating, or is it still going through individual hospitals and, and health systems? Stephanie, thanks very much for that question. I want to say there 
not only are a lot of people in the state, there have been a lot of people around the country that have wanted to help out with, with PPE. Some have reached out to me, others have reached out to our team. Uh, people are reaching out to, to Dr. Christ. Uh, Dr. Christ, will you give a, a way that they can contact us or, or whoever uh, so that we can receive this PPE? Thank you. Anne Marie. The uh, Arizona Coalition for Healthcare Emergency Response is www.azcher.org. That's a central repository for those who have needs and then those who actually have supplies. So if anybody goes to that website, they can see what the needs are in your community and you can post if you have supply. So this is a statewide uh, resource that anyone can access via the web. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and I think you can see also from Dr. Christ's presentation and, and the PowerPoint, uh, the hundreds of thousands of items that we've been able to accumulate. Uh, we need more, of course, uh, but, but we are in a position today where anyone who needs the care or, or comfort of our health care providers will get it. What, what we wanted to do is was put it out there. It's in uh, it, it's in uh, alignment with the the federal uh, recommendations uh, as as well, and we'll revisit as as necessary. Well, I, I've made a commitment that we're going to be timely and transparent. When I know something, you're going to know something. We're putting out all the information that I'm being briefed on uh, every morning and every evening on the uh, azhealth.gov website. This has been a, a very difficult line to walk, as you can imagine, because we have such discrepancies between families that have the technology at home, who have internet connection, who have laptops, um, and then the students who don't. And we've been collecting data on what the needs are of our students by asking districts who have been serving their families. And there are, I mean, it's, it's much larger than I ever could have imagined. It's, probably over 100,000 um, at a minimum of students who don't have the, the technology at home. And then when we've looked to see how can we mitigate that, what could we possibly do, there's also the issue right now that laptops and hotspots are on back order because the entire country has been shifting to telecommuting. I've even re reached out to our business leaders in Arizona and asked, do you have any extra laptops that you could provide our students? I've reached out to our our college and university partners to see, do you have extra laptops? Um, so this is a very serious issue. There are also students who, some of our students with disabilities who can't access curriculum by going online. They just, due to physical or um, other types of cognitive Im impairments, would not be able to access the learning online. So I already know this is gonna cause a huge divide in the students who have the means and the students who don't have the means. And it's, it's frankly heartbreaking for me to think about. And so we're doing everything we can as a state, reaching out to all of our state agencies, to our business partners, to our, our universities and colleges, because this is not gonna be a short-term issue, this is gonna be a long-term a long issue for our students. So what happens next year? I can just leapfrog mm -hmm. into August. Mm -hmm. There's all this uncertainty about the academic credentials 
of the students going to the next class. How, how does that change your world, the world of teachers? Well, I am thankful that we've been in very close communication with school leaders. We've been convening groups of superintendents and charter leaders to talk about that, to talk about what does this look like. I think right now we're very focused on this school year of what does graduation look like, what does is, what is online learning or distance learning look like. So we're, we're pretty focused on that right now, but we've already started to broach that conversation of what might this look like for the next school year. And I know that conversation will continue. And I'm also very thankful, I didn't mention this before, but thankful for the federal funds that are coming our way through the federal stimulus funds. We expect hundreds of millions of dollars that will give our schools a boost that could also be used for things like technology. We're going to go up front here and we'll warm up on the board, please. Sure. Uh, Wendy Smith, we, of course, resigned recently, saying essentially that you're not following the emergency management plan. Could you tell us what that plan is, why you're not following it, and, of course, your response to your resignation? So uh, I want to say thank you to Wendy Smith-Reeve for her years of, of state service. I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, when there's a, an emergency, uh, I expect DEMA to serve in a support role. When there's a wildfire, uh, the director of fire and forestry takes the lead, and DEMA serves in support. Today we have a public health emergency. Dr. Kara Christ and the Department of Health Services is taking the lead. My expectation is that DEMA will be in a support role, and they are in a support role led by Major General Mick McGuire. We're going to go to the board here. Jared, with the Arizona Mirror. Jared, go ahead. Hi. Um, this question is for uh, General, uh, uh, Major General McGuire, as well as Dr. Kerry Chris. I was hoping to um, get some information about, you spoke about what's going on with Chinle taking Black Hawk helicopters out there. I'm curious as to what kind of efforts are being done to help the more rural areas of Arizona to ensure that you know they're getting the supplies they need and the things that they need uh, in this crisis. We have a lot of areas in Arizona that are in areas that are hard to access with infrastructure that's not exactly there, especially in areas of now remote nation. I'm just kind of curious as to what efforts are being done to ensure that these areas are getting the resources they need in order to combat this uh, right pandemic. Yeah, thank you for the question. So. Uh, Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon, I coordinate with all tribal emergency managers, 22 tribes that have lands in the state, and all 15 county emergency managers where they have a direct line to me at any time. Uh, they can get me hold, hold of me other than that, but where they look forward about what they think they may need to have resource. As I mentioned earlier when we talked about Tuba City, and, and you can think about parts of this Arizona, uh, in Arizona the difference that we have uh, in Arizona is, in many ways, the fact that we're 400 nautical mile by 400 nautical mile square. It's a long way to cover, and, and sometimes what is an emergent situation. So to your question, all of the rural counties are being serviced today. On my noon call today, the two counties that's, that were most confident that they had um, bridged the gap on the food supply and securing food, ice, water, and medicine were actually Apache and Gila County. Two counties that were hit pretty hard with the surge in uh, purchasing, but those two county emergency managers said, General, we appreciate the fact that we were in all 15 counties from Friday all through the weekend on that resupply mission, and if there is medical needs in those rural uh, areas that we need to get them out, that's why we have two Black Hawk helicopters on alert out at Papago Park centrally located in the state to transfer material and staffing, medical staffing mostly, uh, if needed. Not necessarily patient. We have a whole air ambulance system that covers that. So that's how we're, we're servicing the rural communities right now. Thank you. So all of those decisions will be happening at the local district level. I've already been in communication with some districts about what they've been thinking about, thinking of creative ways, maybe using videos. I know some districts are looking into postponing ceremonies and things like that, but um, each of those decisions will be made at the local level, and tomorrow the State Board of Education will be meeting to discuss graduation requirements.
Real quick, really briefly, Governor, I'm looking at your executive order here, and I, not only do I not see any provisions for enforcement of penalties, it even says no person shall be required to provide documentation or proof of their activities to justify their activities under this order. This seems to be... There, there is enforcement in the order. I mean, my attorney wrote it. We'll get you the, the details on it. Uh, the, the executive order that was put out in addition to the... the declaration that we've had on public health emergency is to increase the guidance in Arizona. We're asking Arizonans to stay home, to stay healthy, and to stay connected. So I want to uh, thank you. We'll continue to give you the information as things change in, in real time. I'm grateful to the team behind me. Uh, and I really want to emphasize this idea of, of staying home uh, staying healthy, and then staying connected. Call your mom, call your grandmother. That's what I'm going to do. Have a good day. Thank you.